Hey, no lie. Uh, then welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to be having our 11th lecture and we're going to be presenting some cutting edge research from our group. Uh, I guess we have four uh, or, or six papers uh, today, somewhere around that. Basically, as soon, like uh, uh, if the time essentially allows us, we're going to be presenting many works uh, today. And I'm going to be starting uh, with uh, Rohesh. Uh, I'm John. I'm a PhD student in the Safari Research Group. And I'll actually present another work right after this uh, uh, paper pretty quickly. So yeah, let's talk about Rohesh. So Rohesh, uh, enabling fast and accurate real-time analysis of Ronan nanopore signals for a uh, large genome. So this is a bit about the genome analysis, which I also mentioned in the, in the last uh, week's lecture. Uh, so what is uh, nanopore sequencing? Nanopore sequencing is uh, one of the widely used sequencing technology out there. So it has uh, uh, several benefits, such as it can sequence uh, large uh, fragments of nucleic acid molecules, large fragments of DNA, up to 2 million bases. It offers very high throughput. Uh, it is relatively cost-effective, and it provides some unique benefits, such as real-time genome analysis. Um, all right, so then let's look at how nanopore sequencing works. So this figure shows uh, uh, a sequencing of a uh, DNA uh, nucleic acid molecule up there while it moves through a tiny pore called nanopore. So as it moves through the tiny pore, this nanopore, the ionic current measurements are generated at a certain throughput, and these measurements correspond to particular bases uh, in the DNA. And while these, uh, and this is basically in the form of electrical signals. And while these raw electrical signals are generated, we can utilize, utilize some computational tools to uh, analyze this raw signal while matching the throughput of the device, which we call uh, real-time analysis. And this real-time analysis can be useful for many reasons. Uh, one uh, particular reason is, is the ability of taking real-time decisions. This means that we can actually stop the sequencing of a read or the entire sequencing run early based on this real-time analysis. So there are mainly two benefits of real-time analysis. First one is it enables us to overlap the, uh, uh, the, the essential, reduce the uh, entire uh, latency of genome analysis by overlapping the sequencing time with the analysis time. Uh, the second benefit is that we can essentially uh, stop this, uh, the sequencing of a single read or the entire run uh, uh, rather than sequencing it fully, which can, which has the potential to reduce the sequencing cost and the time uh, significantly. And there are also certain challenges for real-time genome analysis. First one is we need to essentially match the throughput of the nanopore device uh, to enable real-time analysis. We need to make timely decisions, quick decisions, because we don't want to unnecessarily sequence the DNA. We want to stop the sequencing of DNA as soon as possible. The third uh, challenge is we want to make accurate analysis because we analyze these raw signals, which are usually noisy, and but we still want our analysis to be accurate. And we also want to make all these computation power efficient because we can essentially sequence, we can use these uh, sequencers uh, with mobile devices, which essentially has uh, 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 limited, let's say, uh, computational resources and, and the battery. Uh, uh, essentially. So with that, uh, I'll basically go over our executive summary. Uh, the real-time analysis of raw nanopore signals usually lacks the necessary accuracy and speed, especially for large genomes. Our goal is to enable fast and accurate real-time analysis of raw nanopore signals for large genomes. And to this end, we make two key contributions. The first one is we propose the first hash-based mechanism that can quickly and accurately analyze raw of nanopore signals for large genomes. And the second is we propose a novel technique that we call sequence until that can accurately and dynamically stop the entire sequencing run of all reads at once if further sequencing is unnecessary. Uh, we provide essentially uh, some key results uh, across three use cases on five uh, real genomes of varying sizes. Uh, we show significant speed ups such as up to 26X and the 3.4X better average throughput compared to the existing state of the art works. We also provide uh, around 1.15 and 2.13 more accurate mapping results uh, for large genomes. And our sequence until technique reduces the sequencing time and cost by 15x. So before diving into our work role hash, I'll show the, uh, the uh, two main approaches, two main existing works. The first one is to use essential deep neural networks to translate these raw signals into bases. 
Uh, this approach essentially provides more accurate analysis because it, it has the potential to reduce the noisy analysis uh, from uh, raw signals as we move from raw signals to the basis. Uh, uh, but essentially, this uh, requires some costly and power hungry uh, uh, computational uh, 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 resources, let's say, to uh, use these, utilize these DNN based works. The second approach is to map these signals directly to reference genomes without base calling them. So the base calling would be these translating these signals to the bases. Uh, so basically this offers uh, uh, certain opportunities such as uh, raw signals uh, uh, contains richer information than just individual bases. So it has the potential for more accurate analysis. And it also provides the opportunity for efficient analysis with better scalability and portability because we don't have to use these costly DNN approaches. So if you look these, uh, uh, mapping raw signals directly uh, 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 to reference genomes more closely, let's say. Uh, so when we're doing this analysis for small reference genomes, such as a bacteria or viral genomes, we see that there are fewer candidate regions in these small genomes. So this means that we can make accurate mapping and also we can still provide some high throughput because of because the, these, these type of genomes are small. So when we basically move to the large genomes, what we see is that uh, the, there is a substantial larger number of regions that we need to check per read as the genome size increases. So this is problematic for two reasons. There are some mechanisms which are probabilistic. So these mechanisms become uh, very inaccurate because of these in increased number of regions. So they, uh, it, make, it makes them challenging to make, let's say, accurate decisions among these uh, many regions. The second problem is that uh, some other approaches perform some distance calculation uh, on many regions uh, with, as this genome size increases. So this means that their uh, performance or the throughput decreases substantially because of this distance calculation that they are making. Uh, so then we find that the existing solutions are either inaccurate or inefficient for large genomes. Uh, then uh, I'll essentially go over uh, raw hash R work. Uh, so in this work, our goal is to, is to enable fast and accurate real-time analysis of raw non apport signals for large genomes. Uh, to this end, we propose raw hash, and we make two key contributions. Uh, first, we propose the first hash-based uh, search mechanism uh, to, quickly and uh, to quickly and accurately map raw non apport signals to reference genomes. Second, we propose a technique called sequence until that can accurately and dynamically stop the entire sequencing run at once if further sequencing is unnecessary based on some computation that we're making. So I'm going to be discussing uh, uh, this, the first uh, 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 contribution. So uh, the key idea or the key observation that we make in raw hash is that uh, uh, these raw signals uh, are essentially the identical nucleotides uh, 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 may uh, have different raw signals. So although they can, provide the same content in terms of the nucleotides, their so, raw signals will uh, vary because of essentially the noises these raw signals are carrying. And essentially one idea to still identify these similarities is to make some distance calculation between these raw signals. For example, you may apply some Euclidean distance and then you can calculate the distance and then you can figure out whether these signals are close to each other. However, this is very costly. This becomes ex extremely costly, especially for large genomes. And our idea is essentially to, uh, instead of doing this distance calculation, to generate some hash values from these raw signals and then quickly these match these hash values to identify the similarity. But to achieve this, there are some uh, challenges. The first challenge is that we need to be generating the same hash value from similar enough signals, although these signals are different, let's say, if they are similar enough, we should be able to generate the same hash value to, to be able to match them. The second is that we need to be, be, be basically able to accurately to find similar regions uh, as few as possible. So we don't really want to unnecessarily increase the regions that we're finding if they are inaccurate. Uh, so then uh, these are the overview of the steps that we're taking in raw hash. First, we start by converting the reference genome and the raw signals to the uh, to essentially the representative of uh, to some basic values that are representative of KMERS, which are subsequences of the reference genome and the signal, uh, and then essentially to reduce the variation effect, we quantize these values into smaller values, and then. Uh, by merging some of these quantized values into a single value, we generate their hash values. 
And then by matching these health series, we figure out some matching regions between the reference genome and row of non apport signals. And then we perform further more, uh, let's say, uh, 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 sensitive analysis to figure out the similarity between the uh, row of non apport signals and the reference genome. And essentially, this part is done only uh, once per reference genome. So the reference genomes are constant, more or less. So you can do this step only once. And then, for example, you can do this for human reference genome. And whenever you have reads from a, uh, from a human genome, you essentially can repeat these steps in real time and then uh, use the data that we generate in this step to figure out uh, for similarity. So I'll go over uh, these steps uh, step by step, essentially, starting with the first step, which is uh, the conversion from the reference genome and the signal to, uh, to the event values. So what is an event value or what is an event? So event is essentially a segment, some segment of the raw signal, which corresponds to a particular k like particular subsequence uh, 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 of length k. And uh, the event detection mechanisms finds these segments to identify the k -mers. So this is essentially the idea. And so these start and end positions are usually marked by abrupt changes in the signal that corresponds to essentially new sequencing of a new base in, in, in this particular uh, nanopore. And to identify these abrupt changes, usually the statistical methods are used. Uh, and essentially after we identify these abrupt changes, these segmentation points, what we do is that we take the average of these signals within, within a particular segment and then figure out the uh, the average value, which we call an event value, which corresponds to, let's say, a particular k that we don't know uh, which one it is. Uh, so this is basically the event and the event values. Uh, so then how do we convert the reference genome to the event values? Uh, so this is a reference genome, and this these, these are its k which we covered last week. Uh, to convert the reference genome into uh, event values, we uh, utilize a lookup table that we call k model. This k model essentially provides the expected event values for each k -mer. So what we do is that this, this k model is pre-constructed based on the correct characteristics of nanopore sequencer. And then we essentially use this k model. So we look at the k and then look at the k model and then figure out what is the expected event value for that particular uh, k -mer. And then we do some normalization, et cetera, so that uh, these values are comparable uh, 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 later on. Uh, so this was the reverse uh, reference to event conversion. So how do we convert the signals to events again? Uh, so as I said, we perform a statistical uh, technique uh, that we call event detection. This event detection identifies the signal regions corresponds to, uh, the corresponding to specific k in the signal. Uh, these uh, segmentation techniques are statistical tests essentially to identify the abrupt changes uh, in the signal. And then we calculate the average, calculate the mean, uh, within these segmentation points and then normalize them again so that these values are comparable to the values that we generate from the reference genome. So then this means that we have these consecutive events corresponding to, corresponding to the consecutive k -mers. So the question is, can we now match these events, which are essentially the k -mers, between reference genome and the signal to identify the similarities? So the answer is going to be uh, no, which we're going to be describing in the next quantization step. So remember our observation is uh, remember our observation, which is essentially there are slight differences in the raw signals from identical k because of these noise issues from the nanopore sequencers. So this means that we cannot directly match these event values to each other, it, which is not feasible and accurate. You're not going to be finding many matches due to these variations. So the key idea is that is to quantize uh, these event values so that uh, we can enable assigning this identical quantized value to similar event values. So there is essentially a very uh, simple quantization idea over there to reduce this value into a smaller uh, set of values. It's like a bucketing idea. Uh, so I'm not going to go further uh, into the details of this quantization, uh, which, uh, but I'll basically be describing the next step, which is the hashing step. Uh, so essentially, each event or each quantized event usually represents a very small camera, which is around six to nine uh, characters. So knowing that the uh, reference genome is around 3 billion bases, so this means that you're going to be finding an extremely large number of matches if you essentially rely on a very small uh, sequence. So assume that you're using a subsequence of length 6 and then looking at a, a, a reference genome whose length is 3 billion, then this means that you're going to be finding too many, let's say, uh, matches, which is not really practical or feasible to look at them, to look at such a large number of matches. So then 
essentially our idea is to reduce this potential number of matches. And how do we do it? We essentially create longer k-mers. So this is the idea from shorter k-mers. And how do we do it? We essentially concatenate uh, these consecutive events, their quantized values uh, together. We essentially pack these quantized event values together to generate some value. And then we use some low collision hash function to generate a hash value from it. And so this essentially becomes the hash value for a longer k-mer uh, that uh, we sequence from, from a sequencer. So these, these are essentially all the steps up until, up until here. Uh, so this means that we now have these hash values from both reference genome and the raw signals. So then this means that we can store the hash values that we generate from reference genome and then uh, query this hash table using the hash values that we generate uh, from signals uh, that are generated in real time. And then if there are some matches, these are the matching positions. These are our candidate regions that can be similar, let's say, between the reference genome and the, and the signal. And then further, we do some sensitive calculation, which are chaining, which is some essentially dynamic programming-based calculation uh, to identify the, the real, let's say, the uh, similar regions. And then we do these operations essentially continuously as the raw signals are generated in real time. We continue to decide whether we should continue mapping the signal or not. So if we essentially should continue, we process the next chunk of data and then do all these steps again and then make the decision again. And this decision is based on like essentially some, let's say, uh, confidence, whether we can map this read confidently to a particular region or not. And if we can decide on that, we say, okay, uh, then this read maps somewhere so we can stop mapping. And this means that we can, we can stop sequencing that read by using uh, these uh, techniques uh, known as read until and run until that are specific to the nanopore sequencers. So this essentially is what we're proposing in raw hash. We also have another uh, 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 contribution in this paper, but due to the time limits, I'm not going to be talking about this. So if you are interested in it, you can take a look at the paper to learn more about sequence until. So let me then show you some results. Uh, we compare our tool, raw hash, to the state-of-the-art works, uncalled and uh, SIGMAP. Uh, this is our essential CPU, and we use 32 threads. We have three use cases, read mapping uh, and uh, relative abundance estimation, meaning we are trying to estimate the abundance or the presence of each genome in a sample co uh, correctly, and some contamination analysis, like we're trying to identify whether the sample is contaminated with a particular genome. Uh, uh, we have several evaluation metrics. Uh, one is throughput, which is essentially measuring the number of bases that we can process per second. And it is important to provide higher throughput than the device's throughput so that we can make real-time analysis. Uh, we are also measuring the potential reduction in sequencing time and cost uh, by the ability of stopping the sequencing of a read early. And we're also measuring the accuracy of our uh, mapping. Uh, and our baseline is uh, some, uh, let's say, very accurate tool uh, that maps the reads that maps, maps the base code reads. And we use five real data sets of varying sizes, some viral genomes, uh, bacterial genomes, and also a human genome. And uh, we combine them for the other use cases. So the first result is about throughput. Here in the throughput we show, on the y-axis we show the throughput results, on the uh, x-axis we show the data sets uh, that we use, and these bars are corresponding to the, to the uh, tools that we use. So if essentially, uh, a bar is above this line, then this means that this tool can achieve real-time analysis because it is it provides a higher throughput than the nanopore devices throughput, which is around 450 bases per second. If the bar is below this line, then this means that the real-time analysis has failed. Uh, so the first result, we pro uh, raw hash provides significant uh, throughput improvements compared to these uh, tools because of this efficient mechanism of finding similarities. The second observation is that the, one of the uh, tools, which is SIGMAP, actually fails uh, cannot perform real-time analysis for large genomes because of this com uh, computationally costly distance calculation that is performing, which I mentioned earlier in my slides. Uh, so the second uh, result that uh, I want to show is that uh, how many bases that we need to sequence before making a decision. So here we compare against uncalled, which can make real-time analysis for large genomes, and here the lower is better. So what we observe is that for large genomes, raw hash needs to sequence essentially fewer bases to make a decision. So this means that it enables uh, reducing the sequencing time and cost substantially if you are analyzing large genomes, essentially. And we'll look at also the accuracy uh, results. And again, what we observe is that for large genomes, raw hash provides the best accuracy overall in all metrics. 
resulting in uh, uh, 1.14 and 2.13 improvement in the F1 score. And for smaller genomes, what we observe is that the other tools are essentially more accurate because of their more sensitive, let's say, similarity calculation that they are making, which is also making them, let's say, slower for large genomes. Uh, so this is also another accuracy measurement uh, based on relative abundance estimation. What we observe is that raw hash can provide the best relative abundance estimation compared to the ground truth, uh, 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 based on the ground truth uh, compared to other tools. Uh, also, although I didn't describe the sequence until, which can essentially stop the entire sequencing run uh, without sequencing the entire sample, which is usually the case in uh, usual uh, sequencing analysis. So what we observe is that by only sequencing 7% of the entire sample, we can still make as accurate as analysis as, uh, as we're making when we're sequencing essentially the entire uh, sample. So this means that we can sequence only 7%. This means that we can reduce the sequencing time and cost by almost 15 X, but still provide very accurate results. Uh, and there are some simulated benefits of the sequence until for other tools. So if you're interested, in, you can take a look at uh, the paper. We also show more results in the paper, like performance breakdown and also the mapping time per read, et cetera. Details of the all other mechanisms such as quantization and the other configurations that I couldn't find a time to describe these uh, today. So if you're interested, then you can take a look at this. So this is raw hash and uh, the source code is available. It's also very easy to install and use. So if you want to essentially improve, you can uh, definitely uh, uh, download this uh, source code and then make your changes as uh, very modular essentially uh, to, to improve. Uh, so what it, what's one benefit is that since we now can generate hash values and then figure out the similarities using hash values, which is an approach used for base code reads. When you base code them, what the usual approach is to again generate their hash values and then find similarities. So this means that actually we can now utilize the improvements or the mechanisms that we have been using for the base code trees for these raw signal. Uh, one approach or one step for this is sketching. The sketching, if you remember from last week, is the sampling mechanisms or uh, figuring out which seeds to use in the subsequences. For example, we could use minimizers, stop mers, or blend uh, as sketching techniques so that we can actually even further improve our similar to search with these hash values. Uh, so with that, I'll essentially conclude raw hash. So we make two key contributions. Uh, one is first hash-based search mechanism that can be applied to raw signals to identify the similarities quickly. Second is the sequence until that can stop the entire sequencing run uh, at once if uh, further sequencing is unnecessary. Uh, we provide significant, we show significant improvements in throughput and also accuracy uh, with this approach. And then we essentially see many opportunities that can be improved uh, on top of raw hash, such as uh, applying other sketching techniques, also uh, doing some on the fly uh, uh, indexing for other uh, use cases. So this is raw hash. Uh, I'll quickly, very quickly with two slides mention raw hash too, which is essentially an improvement on top of raw hash. Uh, I'll just essentially mention our optimizations that we're making uh, again on top of raw hash. So one optimization that we're making is uh, we're essentially applying more sensitive chaining algorithm. Uh, remember I mentioned you some dynamic programming based algorithm that can figure out very sensitively the, the similarities between a raw signal and the reference genome. Uh, there, we make it even more sensitive. This means that this is now more costly. It requires, uh, let's say, more computations, uh, but now we can increase even accuracy even further. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we are also making now our mapping decisions based on some weighted decisions. So in a sense, this is like some learned mapping, let's say, uh, decisions based on the ways that we're choosing uh, from based on some empirical analysis. Uh, so this means that we can now uh, make these mapping decisions faster and more accurate. We're also integrating some frequency filters or some filters that uh, removes some uh, hash value matches before applying chaining. This means that we can reduce the workload of chaining a lot by removing some of these hash values. Uh, but the downside is that removing these uh, hash values can also reduce the sensitivity a bit, uh, essentially. The other uh, optimization is that uh, uh, I mentioned you, we can now apply these new sketching techniques. Indeed, we do uh, in raw hash too. We integrate, we implement, for example, minimizers and then uh, essentially evaluate its benefits. What we see is that we can essentially uh, reduce the uh, 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 storage requirements and also the improved performance a lot with this minimizer. 
And then we also provide some support for the newer features of this nanopore sequencer, such as there's this newer file format uh, that the uh, Oxford nanopore technologies are using. And also uh, uh, there's this newer, uh, 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 and essentially chemistries or newer, let's say, sequencing technologies that are more accurate. We're also supporting these. Uh, some results, uh, ROHash2 provides 2.3x better average throughput than ROHash. Uh, because of these frequency filters and the other improvements. Uh, also, ROHash2 is more accurate in all metrics than ROHash because of the better, more sensitive chaining. Uh, uh, also, ROHash2 uses fewer bases to sequence. This means that it can reduce the sequencing time and cost further than ROHash in all cases. And also for larger genomes, ROHash2 uses the smallest number of bases to sequence uh, uh, compared to all tools. So this was uh, ROHash2. And I guess with that, uh, uh, I think I'm already over time, but I'll conclude. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, all right. Thanks, thanks again. Well, there won't be a beauty contest today, I hope. Um, huh? What do you mean? Why are we here otherwise? Um, <clears throat> very good. Let me also get the timer. So, uh, hi, I'm Joel. This is the second, maybe third project that we're going to present here. Um, this is about Scrooge. As uh, a paper that I led, and we presented this. There we go. Uh, we presented this at Recomp Seek uh, this year. I also got it published in the Bioinformatics Journal earlier this year. So the full title is Scooter Fast and Memory Frugal Genomic Sequence Aligner for CPUs, GPUs, and ASICs. So uh, we're working uh, on multiple hardware architectures, which hopefully uh, will have some interesting insights and working specifically on the sequence alignment part of uh, genomic analysis. So recall that from uh, earlier lectures, also from John, I think he showed some plots that parallel sequence alignment is first of all a recurring kernel in such read mappers, for example, uh, and it's uh, often the bottleneck in these workloads. Now, Genasm is a prior algorithm, so prior to our work, um, that was proposed by Damla from, well, a former PhD in our group. Um, and uh, this algorithm basically is a dynamic programming algorithm. It fills a table of bit vectors and then does some kind of um, traceback computation. And most interestingly, it does all of this with just bitwise operations. So our goals in this work were to build a practical and efficient implementation of this algorithm uh, for multiple computing platforms before this only existed as an ASIC. And uh, we want to compete with the state-of-the-art pairwise sequence aligners that we had in software. So we proposed this Scrooge work, uh, which consists of three novel algorithmic improvements that address some 
inefficiencies in the GNASM algorithm that we had identified. Um, we open source all of our implementations, so uh, you have CPU and GPU versions of this. Which is right. Oh no, that's bad. Uh, well, fortunately, this talk is online also. Did we stop the screen share? How unfortunate. Oh. Yeah. Good thing we have a copy of this talk. Uh, so um, we have open source implementation of this. Is it good now? Perfect. Uh, we have open source implementations of this. And well, you can now just run this algorithm on GPU. If you have NVIDIA GPU at home, you can actually try this. And we observe quite good speed ups with our algorithmic improvements on all of the architectures, all the platforms that we tried. So we also observed that it consistently outperforms the state of the art. There are sequence alignment baselines that we wanted to outperform. Okay, I'll go very quickly over this background because you already saw much of it. We're no longer working on raw signals here, but rather for base called sequences. So um, we want to always find differences between some kind of reference string and a read. So this can be substitutions, insertions, or deletions. Um, and then we want to get some kind of cigar string. Those look like this, essentially a summary of the differences between the string pair that we get. Um, it's the cigar string, yeah. So again, we're not doing full read mapping here. This is just pairwise sequence alignment. You get a string, you fully align those two strings to get differences between the two. Um, so traditionally, you do this using a dynamic, arithmetic dynamic programming algorithm, uh, which has yeah, you, you have somehow initialize the border conditions, and then you always take three neighbor values and compute one new value. Um, that's how you fill the table. So these are called Nidelman, Wunsch, Smith, Waterman, Goto, um, Wavefront, WFA is a slightly different variant. These types of algorithms, there exist many of them, and they were invented sometime back in the 70s by multiple people at the same time, uh, but they're all at the high level look the same. They fill this table out of numbers. Now the key difference in GNASM here is that these are all bit vectors. And it still uses three neighbor entries to compute one new entry to fill the table in the end. But it's bitwise operations and that's particularly efficient in hardware, especially if you implement this maybe as an ASIC um, because bitwise operations are just really cheap to do with transistors. Um, now the details here are not too important just to give you an idea of how the further computation looks. Uh, once you fill this table, you find the topmost zero in the leftmost column, and then somehow you trace the origin of that zero, and that's how you would obtain your cigar string. But the majority of the workload really lies in computing the table. Um, so we analyzed the GNASM algorithm. Uh, it already has an ASIC implementation. Um, so an ASIC is an application-specific integrated circuit. Yeah, you you synthesize this specific algorithm into a chip that is fixed and it's really effective at it, really efficient. Um, but the question is there still, can we do even better than that ASIC if you build an updated ASIC based on a better algorithm? Um, and then for CPUs and GPUs, we didn't really have extremely performant implementations of this algorithm. So here we want to just figure out, does the algorithm still do well on these other architectures? So we start with a roof line analysis. This is essentially all about memory bandwidth. So we can plot um, the throughput on the y-axis. So a horizontal line gives you the peak compute throughput, but you get out of the functional units of whatever hardware architecture you have. And then you get a sloped roof um, based on whatever memory bandwidth you're considering. And on the x-axis, you would plot the operational intensity. So that's operations per byte accessed from memory. Then you can also compute the operational intensity of the algorithm that you have, and you get such a nice plot. Well, uh, what can we read out of this plot? The desired operating point is clearly at the peak compute throughput. We would like to always use all the functional units that we have. Um, and in reality, 
we're here limited by memory bandwidth because essentially the algorithm over here moves too much data to, um, well, for whatever memory band, mem whatever bandwidth the memory provides. There we go. So clearly there's lost performance in there. We're somehow having hardware that's not utilized efficiently and effectively. Um, so this is the first inefficiency, the memory bandwidth that you have, respectively the data movement that the algorithm requires, is too much. Um, then the second aspect we look at is the memory footprint. So we look at the state-of-the-art CPU and GPU here, which have um, fast on-chip memories, right? These are caches in both cases, but on GPUs, you also have this option of shared memory, which is kind of an unmanaged cache, if you will. You can just write to specific addresses in memory, then you get on-chip memory um, accesses. And these are somehow similar in size. So these are per core memory sizes. And we can plot the memory footprint of the algorithm. Clearly, the algorithm doesn't change between architectures. Uh, now, as you can already see, we're kind of overwhelming the L1 cache on CPUs. On GPUs, it still looks fine for the shared memory. Um, now, we have the issue that this is a single problem instance. And ideally, to really use all the hardware that we have available, we want to use the hardware multi-threading in these architectures. So in Intel speak, this is called hyper-threading. And so you can quickly alternate between two threads and always keep your uh, functional units occupied, for example. And to do that at the algorithm level, really we need to work on two problem instances at the same time, meaning we double our memory footprint, uh, which exacerbates our memory footprint issue. Now we don't even remotely fit into L1 memory anymore, L1 cache. On GPUs, the problem is much worse because uh, by nature, GPUs want to have massive multi-threading. You want to have many, many, many of these threads that exploit the hardware multi-threading, meaning you have a much larger memory footprint now, and even the larger on-chip memory on GPUs is nowhere near enough. So that's the second massive inefficiency we obtained uh, in the algorithm for commodity architectures. Um, we also observed there's some unnecessary work in the algorithm, so somehow some rows in this table are never needed. That's data dependent, but basically as soon as you find that zero in the leftmost column, what we look for, anything below that isn't needed. You don't know this ahead of time, but once you do find it, essentially you could stop. Nothing below that will ever be interesting. Um, the original Genasm algorithm still computed that. Uh, so in summary, we found three inefficiencies. It has a large memory footprint, has a large memory bandwidth requirement, and it does some unnecessary work. And to address these, we proposed the Scrooge algorithm, which consists of memory improvements and efficiency, and efficiency improvement. So the memory improvements try to reduce both the memory footprint and the bam memory bandwidth requirement. Uh, meanwhile, so we call these Sene and Bent, um, which are abbreviations for what you can see there. And then the efficiency improvement eliminates the unnecessary work. Now, due to time restrictions, I'm gonna, just going to show one of these in detail. It's this Sene improvement. Um, the idea here is, so recall this table that the algorithm computes. Um, if you look at one of these entries, um, the entry is really... Well, I've just shown you the, the entries themselves of the table, let's say. But what original Janassen computes and what also Scrooge has to compute is uh, the arrows that go in to each of these entries. Basically, you compute the new entry from three ingoing arrows. Uh, for traceback, you need to traverse these arrows in reverse. And then one natural first step was that Janassen just stored the arrows. So you can, well, traverse them in the opposite direction. Um, it turns out it's sufficient to just store the entry over there. Now, clearly, if you are only storing the entry and you're essentially discarding the arrows that you computed, when you then later during this traceback operation need to traverse the arrows in the opposite direction, you need to regenerate them. Otherwise, you don't know where the arrow goes. Um, but it turns out that's quite low overhead. You need this 
for only very few entries, and it's cheap to do. So this quite easily gives us a 3x reduction in memory footprint uh, and data movement. Okay, so this hopefully gives you an idea how, how such algorithm level improvements look. Um, I'm just going to skip over the slides for the other ones. We find some stuff here that, uh, and then we find some stuff in the table that needs to be computed, but also not stored, um, which gives us a forex reduction in memory footprint and data movement. And over here, the efficiency improvement, early termination, the idea is simply to just stop computing when we find that zero, um, which well, saves us at least 25% of computation on average. Um, yeah, we implement all of these improvements uh, for CPUs and GPUs. We open source them, of course, and now they're quite easy to use library interfaces. So you can uh, check our GitHub for that. We have some nice examples how to use it. You, for the GPU version, we used uh, NVIDIA GPUs. We programmed this in CUDA, but of course you could do this on, well, if you want to use AMD GPUs, you would op use OpenCL probably. It's not that specific to the architecture, I guess. Uh, yeah, we have all of this available on GitHub as with all our projects. And let me just very briefly show some results here. So we use some, you know, real data sets, some simulated data. Um, we also calculate the ASIC footprint and energy uh, based on the previous numbers for, CG uh, for Genasm. I'll just update those basically. And um, well, if you plot throughput on the y-axis, uh, on CPU, you can see Scrooge in blue uh, quite significantly speeds up the alignment over all baselines, including uh, here in particular Genasm, we see a 2.1x acceleration. On a GPU, we get a 5.9x speed up over Genasm, and again, we outperform all baselines. Um, so clearly, this algorithmic improvement somehow work on these commodity architectures. Uh, same thing for short reads. It's just a different type of data, right? Um, but we see that this is consistent across data sets, essentially. We're seeing the best performance from Scrooge and quite significant speed ups on top of Genasm. Okay. Uh, I promised you we also evaluated this on ASIC. Um, now, first of all, we saw that these improvements essentially don't cause significant overheads on top of what Genasm already requires in terms of hardware. They're quite simple, right? Don't store some stuff. Stop your computation early if some condition is true. And well, okay, you might need to regenerate some edges sometimes, um, which turns out is also quite cheap to do in hardware because you don't need to do it often. Um, so we observed that the overheads are small. Now the on-chip memory becomes significantly cheaper. Turns out it's 18x less area and power to keep all the information uh, in Scrooge than what it costs in Genasm. So the memory is really what makes this much more efficient now. The memory cost was the majority in Genasm. Now it's my, a, a small part of it. So overall, we get a 3.6x smaller chip area and 2.1x uh, less power consumption. Yeah, uh, we have much more in-depth evaluation in our paper, including parameter sweeps over threats and algorithm parameters. Um, then we analyze the accuracy of this algorithm. Turns out it actually doesn't give optimality guarantees, but in practice, it's really good. Um, we check out the trade-offs between throughput and accuracy, and we break down also the individual components of the ASIC, uh, some of which I've shown you. Yeah, so uh, we've got this in bioinformatics. We've got it on archive and on GitHub, of course. And uh, let me conclude. Very briefly, we saw that this pairwise sequence alignment problem is quite an important workload. It's quite common in genomics, and it's also a bottleneck in many workloads. Um, our goal was to build an efficient and uh, multi-platform implementation of Genasm, uh, and we want to compete with the state-of-the-art software tools that we have. And to this end, we proposed Scrooge, which consists of three novel algorithmic improvements and open source implementations of these uh, software versions. In the end, we obtained quite nice speed ups on all architectures we evaluated. And well, 
based on this, I would also be willing to extrapolate that also if you implement this on other architectures, let's say an FPGA, probably the Scooch algorithm would also do better than Genasmi. So, well, hopefully you're happy with Scooch overall. <laughs> um, with that, I'll conclude my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Please. <clears throat> just, well, just press the button, I guess. Could we maybe also speed up the Gen ASM algorithm by using something like the upmem architecture? Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, so, especially the memory aspect, right? That in Genasm is quite expensive. It makes a lot of sense to have you know, PIM context, processing and memory context. Um, in fact, the original Genasm accelerator was proposed as a processing and memory accelerator. Over there, it was attached to uh, HBM memory when the logic layer of HBM. Um, that makes sense for sure. Now, one other benefit that helps uh, is that bitwise operations are quite good on upmem. Well, upmem likes simple operations, right? Um, preferably, I guess, some additions, bitwise operations, definitely not multiplication or floating point. Um, but that's definitely, exactly. So that's, that's kind of suitable. Um, now, I'm not sure if we, at some point in some PNS project, actually had an implementation of this uh, on upmem, but um, Basically, definitely makes sense to have it. Is that answer question? <laughs> Very good. Anything else? Very good. Thanks a lot for your attention then. Hello, is it wrong? Feels wrong. Okay. Yes. So uh, this is the next talk. It's about quark TRNG. How many people know about true random number generation or random numbers? That's good. Okay. I hope you learn a bit more about them today. So this is a High throughput true random number generation technique um, using quadruple row activation, and we do this in real DRAM chips. I'm Atabek, I'm a PhD student uh, in the Safari Research Group. I'll start with an executive summary. Uh, we're motivated by the fact that DRAM based true random number generators can provide true random numbers to a wide variety of systems uh, at very low cost. However, there are problems with existing true random number generators that are based on DRAM, they're very slow because they rely on uh, fundamentally slow processes and they have high latency. And they cannot effectively harness entropy from the very large DRAM role. Our goal is to develop a high throughput and low latency to random number generators that uses commodity DRAM devices. And we make a key observation. So we see that a carefully engineered sequence of DRAM commands can enable four DRAM roles at the same time in, a, in real DRAM chips. And our key idea is to use these quadruple activation operations to simultaneously activate rows that are initialized with conflicting data, that means ones and zeros, uh, to generate random values. And we develop quark TRNG, it's a DRAM based random number generator uh, that is based on these quark operations. 
uh, it applies these operations repeatedly to generate random numbers at low latency and high throughput. Uh, we evaluate it using real DRAM chips, 136 of them, and we show that it can generate two random numbers at 5.4 gigabits per second throughput per DRAM channel in your system. It outperforms existing DRAM-based TRNGs by five, 15 times, around 15 times, for their base versions, which means the we evaluate them as they're proposed. And then the enhanced versions, which we enhance by using techniques that we use also in our uh, true random number generator to more fairly compare against existing work. And even then we outperform them by 1.4 times. It can produce random numbers at very low latency. So we can generate a random number of 256 bit random number in 274 nanoseconds. And it also is a high quality through random number generator because it passes all the standardized randomness tests from NIST. So I'll briefly motivate through random numbers first. Uh, high quality through random numbers are used almost everywhere. They're critical to many applications such as cryptography, um, simulations, scientific simulations, and machine learning even. And two random numbers can unfortunately only be obtained by sampling random physical real phenomena. And not all computing systems have hardware, specialized hardware that can harness entropy from these random physical phenomena. Now, DRAM-based TRNGs uh, can fill in this gap because DRAM, is, DRAM chips are ubiquitous, ubiquitous, ubiquitous. I don't know how to pronounce this word, even though I've been presenting this for many times. Uh, they're everywhere in modern computing platforms. And DRAM-based random number generators enable to random number generation inside DRAM chips. They're low cost because you don't need additional specialized circuitry to generate two random numbers. So they're beneficial for constraint systems where you don't have these hardware-based uh, two random number generators. And it can produce random numbers at high throughputs and will open application space that require high throughput tiering, uh, two random number generation um, in those con uh, constraint systems. They're also very synergistic with PIM systems. Uh, you're already aware of them. Uh, these uh, systems do computation in memory and they eliminate, the, uh, eliminate data movement and uh, improve system performance. The true random number generators inside DRAM chips will allow the DRAM chip to generate true random numbers and feed those uh, numbers to security critical applications that are running inside them without going off chip um, <laughs> over a potentially compromised interface. Okay, uh, now I'll quickly go over DRAM background. I think you already know a bit about these things. So the only thing I want to focus here, focus on here is this subarray picture. We have word line drivers and sense amplifiers inside the subarray and the key here is we have DRAM mats. DRAM mat contains the rows, uh, DRAM rows and columns. And you see that inside the DRAM mat, cells are laid out onto a two-dimensional array. Now, this is a simplified diagram of a cell. And then we already know how to access this cell. Basically, uh, we send an activate command that will enable this word line. And once you enable the word line, the capacitor shares is charged with the bit line. This will um, cause the bit line voltage to deviate toward the direction of the value in the cell. And we will enable the sense amplifier at some point. This will, um, this will amplify the voltage deviation to the value of, towards the value of the cell. And this will also st uh, store data back to the cell that it lost through charge shading. Here is another diagram that shows the same operation. So this is now at the granularity of a subarray. And we already, uh, you already know we access DRAM cells in the granularity of a cache line that is typically 512 bits. And on the bottom, we have a command DRAM command sequence timeline. To activate, to access any cell in this first row, we first send an activate command. And then that will copy the data to the sense amplifiers. Now that the data is in the sense amplifiers or the row buffer, this is also called the row buffer, we can send read commands to read data in cache line granularity. And if we want to access another row, we have to pre-charge and then send an activate command and repeat the same thing again. 
Now, two key timing parameters are what's called the activation. The first one is called the activation latency, or TRAS. This dictates the amount of time you need to wait between successive activate and precharge commands. And the other one is the precharge latency, or TRP. And this is the minimum amount of time that we must wait between um, the precharge command and the following activate command. Now I can describe what we observed in real DRAM chips. We see that if we uh, issue a specialized sequence of DRAM commands, we can activate four rows with only two activate uh, commands in real DRAM chips. That's a very simple sequence. So you send an activate and then a precharge command, but you significantly violate the TRAS timing parameter. So instead of waiting for 35 nanoseconds, which is the default value in our chips, we wait for less than three nanoseconds. And then we send another activate command, this time violating the TRP timing parameter. Again, uh, instead of waiting for 14 nanoseconds, the default timing parameter, we wait for less than three nanoseconds. This activates four rows with only two act commands. And I'll describe how we think DRAM chips do this uh, by, by pictures of a hypothetical DRAM uh, row decoder circuit. We also observe two characteristics, two important characteristics of these operations. So the first one is that it activates, a quark operation activates a set of four DRAM rows whose addresses differ only in their uh, two least significant bits. And this is a picture that's depicting a simplified version of the subarray. And you can see um, two groups of rows with different colors here that, uh, uh, that have different two least significant bit addresses. And Quark can open these four rows or these four rows, but it cannot open two rows from one group and two rows from the other group. The second characteristic is that the first and the second activate command must target um, two DRAM row addresses that have their two least significant bits inverted. This means that we can send the first activate command to the to row zero here and the second activate command to row three, the top row, basically the row addresses that are colored the same. As long as we send the two activate commands to those two rows, we will enable all four of these rows. That is depicting what I just described. And a counter example would be basically if you send the first activate command to zero and then the second activate command to row one, you don't observe quadruple activation. We um, we, we basically characterize real DRAM chips. We test this operation on 136 DDR4 chips, and we observe uh, correct quark operation on all of these. So to explain why quark works, we develop a hypothetical uh, row decoder circuitry. And this is based on uh, this is based on hierarchical row decoder uh, circuitries. And they're uh, very widely used because of the high density and performance requirements in real DRAM chips. And hierarchical organization of word lines and row decoders enable high density and low latency DRAM operation. So the, uh, so the designers have been using these techniques for a long time now. Now we'll basically look at what's inside this highlighted region that uh, contains word line drivers and DRAM mats. So this is a, um, the, the depiction of this hierarchical word line scheme I'm describing. Here you see a master word line. Uh, you, you see multiple master word lines that the row decoder drives. And now these master word lines drive multiple local word lines and those local word lines are connected to the um, access transistor that will enable the cell and connect them to the sense amplifiers. But this is what they look like. Uh, at one abstraction level. And then we hypothesize that there are these AND gates that are controlled by a combination of a master word line and these select signals that I depict here as S0 to S3. Now we'll look at how we operate these select signals uh, when we send the quark uh, command sequence. So on the left, we have um, the least significant two address bits of the row address. And on the right side, we will uh, see how the select signals are driven. So the, 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 the circuitry consists of two parts, essentially. The first part predecodes the least significant two bits. 
and um, creates intermediate signals. And the second part, the last uh, part, will drive the control signals based on the intermediate signals. So we see here the both of the address bits have an inverted and uh, their non-inverted values uh, created as the intermediate signals. And there is a latch that will store the um, the value of these intermediate signals. And on the second part, we have four AND gates for each of the select signals that derives the select derives a select signal based on the combination of two of these intermediate signals. Now let's see what happens when we send the specialized uh, command sequence. We will start by sending an activate command to row zero. This will enable latches that drive A0 bar and A1 bar because both of the addresses are zero. And uh, consequently, what happens on the right-hand side of this diagram is you will see that the select signal zero gets enabled. That's perfectly fine. We're trying to activate a row, and we have act essentially activated one row by enabling one of the select signals. But you also see that uh, S1 and S2 have partially driven inputs in their AND gates. And to conclude this slide, is first activate command will drive a single word line. Now we violate the timing parameters and send a pre-charge command. This pre-charge command won't have enough time to disable these latches. This is, the, uh, this is the key part of our hypothesis, essentially. Now when we send the second activate command, again with violated timing parameters, we see that the address, the listing of bits of the address change to one. And that will enable the second set of latches. Now you see that all of the gates are essentially enabled, and all of the select signals are set. Yes, so the second activate drove the remaining three word lines. And then in the end, we have all four word lines enabled. OK, this was the key uh, mechanism of quark operations. So now we go to quark TNG, and uh, this slide I try to describe how we use quark operations to generate random numbers on bit lines. Uh, here you see four rows connected to a bit line sharing the same sense amplifier. And we initialized two of the rows with logic one values and the other two with logic zero values. And here on the right side, we have the voltage difference between the two nodes of the sense amplifier. One end is uh, connected to these four, this side of the, this subway essentially, the other end is kept at half VDD. So this is the reference voltage the sense amplifier needs to work with. And the voltage difference can go up to VDD and down to minus VDD over time. And we also draw two lines here, horizontal lines, VTH and minus VTH. These are the reliable sensing thresholds that the bit line voltage must exceed before the sense amplifier amplifies the voltage so that we have correct operation. If we're left uh, below, if the bit line voltage is below these sensing thresholds, at the point where we enable the sense amplifier, we get random numbers because uh, we get random values due to thermal noise and random perturbations on the bit line signal essentially. So now I'll describe how that happens. We send the activate command to row zero. This enables row uh, zero, and you can see that the bit line voltage it de deviates toward VDD. Then we send a pre-charge command, then an activate command to row three. Now this enables all other uh, word lines. And we see that the voltage difference is still within uh, the reliable sensing thresholds. And at some point after the second activate command, the sense amplifiers will be enabled. And once they're enabled, due to thermal noise or other random physical phenomena, this sense amplifier will sample the bit line voltage as a random value. Now, uh, let's see how we use this mechanism to generate random numbers at very high throughput. So this is, again, a different uh, view of the four rows that we always operate um, on. And we call them, it, basically, we call the four rows that we open simultaneously a DRAM segment. That's just four rows. And we have the sense amplifiers. Uh, the first step to generate uh, true random numbers at high throughput is to initialize these rows. We initialize two of the rows with ones and two others with zero here. And the second step, we perform a quark operation. Now this will generate random values and sense amplifiers. And step 
In step four, we uh, step three, we need to read these values to the memory controller. And to do that, we characterize the DRAM row, uh, the DRAM chips first. This is something I didn't describe yet, and I'll try to describe it in more detail later. Basically, we try to find uh, sets of or collections of cache blocks that have an uh, entropy or um, Shannon entropy of 256 bits. We're trying to make sure that we get enough random bits out of the cache blocks we read. And then we read one such set of cache block and we do some post-processing on it using the SHA-256 cryptography cache function. And then we output a 256 bit through random number. Now, uh, the experimental study quark and quark TNG using 136 chips from SK Hynix, we didn't observe this in chips from other manufacturers. We used the DRAM Bender BDR for testing infrastructure. And uh, first, we measured the randomness of these bit streams using Shannon entropy. What is Shannon entropy? It's, you calculate it like this, but what it basically means is it's, it's a function of the proportional logic one and logic zero values in the random bit stream. And to give you the key idea, basically, before you, I give you the key idea, we sample each bit line following a quark operation 1,000 times and calculate the bit line's Shannon entropy. And the key idea is if you input this sort of a bit stream, like made up of all ones, to this function, you will get a value of zero. Because this is not really random, right? It's just ones. Now, if you have an equal number of ones and zeros in your bit stream, you will get a value between zero and one. The closer you get to one, the, the closer the proportion of ones and zeros are to, get, uh, to each other. So this is a hint that we use to indicate the randomness of our um, cache blocks. And we um, do this at 50 degrees Celsius with nominal or uh, standard DDR4 voltage. We repeatedly perform quark 1,000 times, measure the channel entropy in each bit line. In uh, 8,000 segments, that makes up 32,000 DRAM rows. And we test all possible uh, 16 different 4 bit data patterns. So I try to describe them here. This is one data pattern, uh, all ones. It initializes all rows with ones. And this is another data pattern, one, zero, zero, zero. This initializes the first row with zero, uh, sorry, one, the other rows with zero. We calculate the cache block entropy, which is uh, the sum of all bit line entropies in a cache block. And then we devise two metrics based on cache block entropy. The first one is the average cache block entropy. This is the average entropy across all cache blocks in a DRAM, uh, in a, in a DRAM module. And the maximum cache block entropy is the, uh, the highest cache block entropy in that DRAM module. Now, this plot shows the maximum and average cache block entropy on the y-axis and each bar uh, shows the distribution of those two metrics across the 17 data modules we tested. And on the x-axis, you see different data patterns that we use to initialize the models. Now, the eight, eight of these data patterns are missing, as you can see. Uh, that's because we didn't get in sufficient entropy uh, when we used those eight data patterns. We see that entropy varies with data pattern. And uh, we see that the highest average entropy, um, we obtain the highest average entropy when we use the 0, 1, 1, 1 data pattern. Now, why this happens is basically the first we, we think the first row that we activate has more time to share its charge with the bit lines because the, the other three rows gets activated late. Uh, so the first row has more time to contribute. If it's the inverse of the other three rows, it's more likely that the bit line voltage will end up at a, at a level below, below the reliable sensing threshold. Uh, we also look at how the entropy is distributed across rows in the DRAM chips we tested or module we tested. Here, you see the uh, segment entropy, which is essentially the sum of uh, bit line entropies in a segment or in a row. And on the x-axis, we have the segments or row IDs. Um, we plot three curves here. The first one is the average. The average curve is average across all modules. And we also plot two, um, two other curves for two representative modules that have a distinct pattern, essentially. Now, we see that segment entropy behavior is different for different modules. You can see this highlighted uh, box here has, uh, shows, shows where the two modules have an inverse pattern. One module uh, has 
the lowest entropy, lowest local entropy over there, and the other module has the the, the maximum local uh, essentially entropy over there. Uh, and we think that this might hint to the distance. This this might be relevant to the distance. Uh, of the segment from its sense amplifiers. And towards the end of the bank, we observe the entropy significantly drops. Okay. Uh, so the takeaways from the entropy study is uh, we see that the entropy resulting from cock operations changes with the data parents and the physical location of DM segments. And we attribute them to um, systematic manufacturing process variation and design induced variation effects. Now I'm very slow, so I will go a bit faster. Now, uh, we also measure uh, the quality. So we, we try to assess the quality of our random number streams, and we, de uh, we developed two experiments for that. But basically, the key idea is we have a standard test suite that some brilliant folk developed in the past. Now, e almost every two random number generator is evaluated using these statistical tests. What these statistical tests do is at a very high level, it analyzes the, some key properties of your random uh, bit stream or bit stream that you think is random. And it, it tries to make sure that you, your random bit stream is not predictable by some computer or you know, analysis techniques. And to summarize, we pass all of these tests. So it's a very high quality to random number generator. And then we estimate Cochlear-induced throughput. Uh, according to this formula, um, it basically has to do with how much entropy you have, or what's the highest entropy you have in hi highest entropy cache block in your module. And then the rest is essentially module-independent uh, parameters. I'll skip this, and um, I'll talk about these three configurations of Cochlear-NG. The first one is one bank. We use a single DRAM bank to generate two random numbers. The second one uses multiple bank groups and parallelizes activate pre-charge commands to those bank groups to generate random numbers a bit faster. And finally, we have row clone plus bank group parallelism. So the row clone plus BGP um, also uses row clone operations in real DRAM chips. And the way we do that is we send activate pre-charge activate commands as a prior work showed. Um, and this, this sequence is capable of moving data uh, from one row to another in a subarray. We use that to initialize the uh, DRAM rows prior to performing quadruple activation operation. Uh, the, this is the throughput results that we have. So again, to summarize, we have, we observe 3.44 gigabits per second average uh, through random number generation throughput per DRAM channel. And uh, we see that when we use row clone to initialize DRAM rows, we improve performance significantly. We compare Coactier Engine to state, two state of the art uh, two random number generators, DRAM based two random number generators. D range relies on activation latency failures, and uh, the other work, if you refer to as Tolkler and others, uh, relies on precharge latency failures. We calculate their throughput similarly to how we calculate Coactier uh, NGs, and we evaluate two versions of each mechanism. The first one is a base, it's as they're proposed, and the enhanced version uses. Um, SHA-256 to optimize their throughput further. And we assume a four-channel DDR4 for memory. Uh, this plot shows the throughput of uh, on the y-axis and um, um, the DDR4 transfer rate on the x-axis. Now we project that DDR4 rate, the transfer rate is going to increase and you see some values that don't exist in the real standards here. But the key idea is as, uh, as um, DDR4 throughput increases, uh, quark TNG provides more uh, higher benefits over state of the art. We have more details in the paper, and uh, yeah, that's it for quark TNG. I guess in 26 minutes. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, so I have some slides for that. Let me bring that up. That's a good question. That's the trickiest part because we use the post-processing mechanism and that helps us significantly reduce the bias. There's something called bias in uh, two random number generators, uh, basically because we cannot really control this underlying physical phenomena. Um, and most 
phenomena are biased to produce either ones or zeros. Uh, we also suffer from it, but the SHA-256 SHA function uh, allows us to eliminate it a lot. The question is, do you still pass those tests if you don't have such a strong post-processing function? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, we also, but in, even in that case, we have to post-process with a much lighter weight post-processing technique that we use the this von Neumann corrector for that purpose. Uh, basically what this does is um, when we look at quark bit streams, we see that we, we have a um, sequence of zeros followed by a sequence of ones, a lot of ones and zeros everywhere. Uh, what von Neumann corrector does is if you, the moment you transition from that zero sequence to one sequence, you generate, um, you consider that to be one bit. So you eliminate the redundancy essentially. And with the von Neumann corrected bit streams, you also pass the NIST tests. Yes. But if you just do quark and read the numbers, uh, read the values, you won't pass any tests. Okay. That's it. Yes. In the DRAM lectures, we heard that that sometimes sub, uh, sometimes rows can be remapped. So are you sure that these four rows are all the same subarray? Uh, yes, that's a good question. Um, there is row remapping. Are we affected by My short answer would be we didn't check. Um, but let me answer this way. I guess I don't have any reason to believe they're not in the same subarray because um, when we initialize them like the way I described, and we send this command sequence, we saw that we can generate random values uh, in the sense amplifiers. Now, if some of them were remapped to other subarrays, um, I guess we could still get random values because you, in the end, we cannot predict what the bit bind voltage will be, even if we work with three rows or two rows or just one row. Um, I guess it could be possible, but we didn't specifically check for it. The fact is uh, we can generate two random numbers. Yeah. And we still have some entropy. Yeah. Okay. Should I continue with SMD or not? Yeah. Okay, we have something on Zoom. We don't have anything on Zoom. Cool. Uh, yeah, tomorrow we've had, we will have the memory controllers lecture. And um, we'll also, I guess we scheduled the presentation for today, uh, self-managing DRAM. I'll also talk about it tomorrow in the, in the memory controllers lecture. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much it, I guess. Thanks.
Nika, can you please share your slides? Yes, sure. Do you see them? Yes, looks good. Yeah, I think you can get it started. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, do you also hear me well? Yes, and you can hear us well, right? Yes, great. Okay. So hello everyone, I'm Nika, and today I'm going to introduce GenStore, a high performance and storage processing system for genome sequence analysis. So genome sequence analysis is critical for many important applications such as personalized medicine, outbreak tracing, and evolutionary studies. And genome sequencing machines extract the smaller fragments of the original DNA sequence known as reads. Read mapping is one of the first key steps in genome sequence analysis that aligns these smaller segments of reads to potential matching locations in the reference genome. And for each matching location, the alignment step finds the degree of similarity or alignment score between the reads and the reference genome. Calculating this alignment score requires computationally expensive approximate string matching, or ASM, to account for differences between the reads and the reference genome that might occur due to sequencing errors or natural genetic variations. And ultimately, these are these variations uh, that uh, lead to some biological or medical uh, conclusions. Uh, so genome sequence analysis uh, in the read mapping process requires performing this expensive alignment computation in large number of uh, reads. Uh, for example, data sets can have uh, millions of reads. So therefore, uh, this whole process is both computationally expensive and also incurs large data movement overhead. There's been a lot of effort into accelerating this process by proposing various types of heuristics, accelerators, or filters that prune reads that do not require this expensive computation. While these approaches uh, alleviate computation overhead significantly, they do not address the data movement overhead that incurs from storage systems to the rest of the system. So our key idea in this work is to filter reads that do not require that alignment uh, step inside the storage system so that we can fundamentally reduce the uh, data movement overhead across all uh, over the system. And examples of reads that do not require such expensive computation would be exactly matching reads, which are reads that do not require the ASM, uh, this approximate string matching uh, during alignment, or uh, reads that do not match to any location. Therefore, they don't have any potential matching location and they can skip that alignment step. Uh, but doing uh, this filtering operation inside the SSC is challenging because read mapping workloads can exhibit different behavior and there are limited hardware resources in the storage system. By addressing these challenges, we propose GenStore, which is the first in storage uh, system for genome analysis. Uh, they can reduce both computation overhead and also alleviate data movement overhead from storage. And it provides a large uh, speed up and energy reduction compared to state-of-the-art software and hardware baselines. So that was the overview of my talk. Now I provide a little bit more background into the read mapping process before we move on to the rest of the talk. So uh, as we discussed, read mapping requires doing this computational expensive operation and the search space for doing the mapping is large. So let's say human reference genome is more than 3 billion characters. So to enable an efficient search into this large space, we typically use an index of this reference genome that um, has k-mers, which is subsequences of length k extracted from the reference and corresponding locations of these k-mers in the reference genome. Uh, so, uh, to alleviate these uh, overheads of read mapping, state of the art read mappers use several heuristics. And typically, we can say that they fall into these three steps. So, the first step is to determine some potential matching locations or seeds in the reference genome. To do so, we extract some of the cameras from the reads and uh, look up these cameras in the index. If they hit, uh, we mark the corresponding locations of these k-mers in the reference genome as seeds. To further reduce the search space, we have another step called seed filtering, 
or chaining. So we prune some of the seeds in the reference genome based on some um, uh, less computationally heavy approximation of the alignment. And finally, for the um, so some of the reads actually would have no potential matching location, so they get filtered from this step. And the ones that uh, have some potential matching locations remained, they go to the next step in which we perform alignment to determine the exact differences between the read and the reference genome. So uh, we perform an analysis on um, the stream mapping process to uh, find out the impacts of uh, IO overhead from the storage system on the performance of the application. And we uh, analyze uh, the read mapping on real genomic uh, data sets with various read mapping systems in software and hardware and various state-of-the-art SSD configurations. And uh, we make several observations that I summarize here briefly. First, the ideal in storage filter significantly improves performance by reducing the computation overhead and data movement overhead. And filtering outside SSD provides relatively lower performance because, okay, first of all, it does not reduce the data movement over from storage. And second, it must compete with read mapping for uh, other system resources, such as uh, external SSD bandwidth, main memory bandwidth, and computation resources. So it leads to lower uh, benefits compared to filtering transgress inside the SSD. And uh, finally, a hardware accelerator used for accelerating computation bottlenecks to read mapping um, in such a system, we observe that I.O. overheads from the storage system uh, takes a larger bottleneck in the system because relatively the impact of computation overhead has become smaller. So motivated by these observations, our goal is to design a new storage filter for genome sequence analysis in a cost-effective manner. And to that end, we have several design objectives. First is to achieve high performance. So provide uh, the in-storage filtering performance such that uh, the high performance such that the filtering process that happens inside the storage can overlap uh, with the read mapping of unfiltered data happening in other parts of the system. So innovative filtering would be fully masked in the SSD. And second would be applicability to support reads with different properties and different degrees of genetic variation in their compared genomes. The third is low cost, uh, which is not to require significant hardware overhead. And to that end, we propose GenStore, which is the first in storage uh, system for genome sequence analysis. And the key idea is to filter reads that do not require alignment inside the storage system and send the remaining reads to uh, other parts of the system, for example, to the host system uh, for further processing. And that has challenges as we discussed because read mapping incurs different type of behavior um, in different data sets. And we have limited hardware resources in the SSD. Uh, so let's take a look at the filtering opportunities that exist. Uh, sequencing machines produce generally one of two kinds of reads. So short reads that are highly accurate and short, let's say up to a few hundred DNA characters and long reads that are less accurate and longer, for example, up to, so from few hundreds to few millions of DNA characters. And uh, based on these uh, reads, there are uh, two, key read, uh, two key classes of reads that do not require the expensive alignment step. One are exactly matching reads uh, that do not require expensive approximate string matching because they just uh, exactly match. And examples of these reads happen in reads with low sequencing error rates, short reads, combined with low genetic variation. For example, humans usually do not have that much uh, genetic variation. Uh, and non-matching reads are reads, uh, another class of reads that are not require expensive alignment step. And examples of these reads are uh, reads that do not have potential, uh, like, the reason that we don't need alignment for them is that there is no potential matching locations for them after the second step of mapping that we discussed, so they can fully skip alignment. And examples of these reads happen in reads with high sequencing error rates or long reads, or reads with high genetic variation, no matter short or long. And examples of high genetic variation you can have in like some bacterial or viral samples that have very high mutation rates. 
Uh, so by analyzing these uh, types of uh, uh, opportunities in read mapping for filtering reads, uh, we uh, design GenStore in two parts. So first is GenStore EM for exactly matching reads, and the other one is GenStore NM for non-matching reads. So let's go to GenStore EM first. So GenStore EM is an efficient and storage filter for reads that have at least one exact match in the reference genome. We use simple operations without uh, requiring alignment, uh, but there are some challenges that we address. So first is that there are a large number of, so overall these challenges is not from the fact that there are a large number of random accesses per read to the reference genome and its index. Um, and that is expensive because uh, it's difficult uh, to have uh, random access to flash chips due to its latency. And also we don't have enough DRAM capacity inside the SSD uh, to support these random accesses efficiently. Uh, here I uh, talk about the key ideas that enable addressing these challenges in GenStore EM. The first idea is the read size k-mers to reduce the number of accesses per each read. So if you remember, we were talking in the background that we have reads and generate different k-mers out of that read, and then we do some random accesses in the index to find potential matching locations of these k-mers. Um, and so in the index, we find some locations, and then again, we do some random access to the refresh genome to find the locations of these um, uh, k-mers and to access the relevant parts of the reference. Uh, but the issue is that, uh, as we discussed, we have a lot of random accesses. So the key idea here is to treat the whole read uh, as one single k -mer. So that leads to having only one index lookup per each read. So we reduce the number of uh, these lookups. The second concept is the sorted read size k to avoid random accesses to the index and also yeah, basically, so the index to find these locations. Uh, because we have one access per read, so we actually can sort things in advance. So that is why we can do this. And when we uh, do sorting, we can just do sequential scan of the read set and the index to find the um, matches between them. So I further demonstrate this with a simple example. Here, for the sake of simplicity, I'm showing a read read. Uh, 10 characters, but usually, as I said, the short reads can be up to a few hundred characters. Uh, so we have two data sets. One is a sorted read table, which includes the reads and some ID of these reads. And second, sorted k index, uh, which includes the read size k and the locations of these k uh, in the reference genome. And both of these things are sorted. We find the potential matching location, uh, sorry, we find the matches between these two data sets uh, so that we can find the exact matching locations of the reads in the reference if they actually match. Uh, by a simple comparison uh, between these things. So we stream through these uh, data sets into three ways. First is that if the read and the camera are equal to each other, we detect that the read is an exactly matching read that does not need to go through the remaining steps. So we can be filtered. It can be filtered. So we go to the next element in these uh, data sets. So if the read is bigger than the camera, uh, we detect that uh, nothing has matched so far because they're sorted. So if they matched, we would have seen so far. So we go to the next element in the, in the sorted camera index. And finally, if the read is smaller than a camera, we can detect that uh, the read would match to no camera uh, in the uh, reference. So then it needs to go to read mapping to find, um, to go through the expensive computation, such as this alignment step that we discussed. And then we go to the next element in the sorted read table. Uh, so these operations avoid random analysis. And uh, we can uh, perform uh, all of these with simple low cost logic. Uh, so although uh, there were some benefits, uh, there were these benefits of uh, read sized cameras, uh, there was some issue because it takes large amount of space. So for example, 126 
gigapoints for human index due to the large number of unique k-mers. When the size of k-mers grow large, then mm, the number of unique k-mers increases and the index size grows really large. Uh, so we replace these reads with the strong hash values of the reads to reduce the sizes, uh, size of the index that we need to store. So uh, this thing reduces the size of this index by 3.9 times. Still, it is bigger than the baseline index, but this solution seems to be affordable for in storage processing because we um, usually have less stringent capacity concerns there. And also we can go through this uh, data set with leveraging the full internal bandwidth of the SSD. Okay, let's take a look at the high level design here. Uh, we have a uh, sorted read table and sorted camera index stored in a flash array uh, across different channels and dies and planes in the SSD. So we can uh, interleave to that and fully leverage the internal bandwidth when we read through it. And uh, also we have this simple comparator logic on the SSD controller. So the way it works is that we have the sequential reads to the DRAM inside the SSD in a batched manner, and then we go through them to fill uh, to through the comparator to find exactly matching reads. And steps one and two are happening in a pipeline manner. And during filtering, Genstore EM can already send the unfiltered reads to the host system, so we can hide the latency of the uh, filtering, the read mapping because. Uh, as soon as we detect something that needs read mapping, it can go to the whole system. Does not lead, uh, need to uh, wait for the filtering process to finish. Uh, so for the sake of uh, time, I skip through GenStore and M's design. Please check uh, the slides that will be online or the paper if you're interested. Let's go to the evaluation very quickly. We uh, compared to some state of the art uh, read mappers in software and hardware for short and long reads and different storage systems. Uh, so by the way, in the plots that I will show, base shows the baseline mapper and GS shows this baseline integrated with GenStore. And we also analyze different SSD configurations. Uh, so we here are seeing an example of the human read that is said with 80% exactly matching reads. Uh, we show up to, uh, so we show 2.1, times to 2.5 times speed up and uh, also up to 3.3 times speed up compared to the hardware baseline and an average 3.9 times uh, energy reduction. I skipped Gen Store and M result because we didn't discuss it. So uh, for area and power, we do synthesis of Gen Store accelerators using Synapsis Design Compiler at 65 nanometer technology node. And here for an A-channel SSD, we observed that it takes 0.2 millimeter square area and 26.6 milliwatts. And if we scale down to lower technology nodes, we observe that it is only 0.006% of a 14 nanometer Intel processor and less than 9.5% of the three ARM processors used in a simple SSD controller for a SATA SSD. So the overhead is pretty low. There are also other results in the paper. I skimmed through it uh, right now very quickly. Please again, take a look at the paper if you're interested. So let me just quickly conclude the talk uh, by providing a summary. So there's been significant effort into improving read mapping performance through efficient heuristics, hardware acceleration, and accurate filters. But the problem is that while these approaches address the computation overhead, none of them alleviate data movement over it from storage. And the goal is to improve the performance of genome analysis by effectively reducing unnecessary data movement overhead from a storage system. And the idea to that end is to filter reads that do not require the expensive dynamic computation in a storage system to fundamentally reduce the data movement overhead. And there's been some challenges that we discussed that we have to address that read mapping workloads can exhibit different behavior across different data sets and there are limited available hardware resources in the storage system. And uh, to, by addressing the challenges, we propose GenStore, which is the first in storage processing system designed for genome sequence analysis to reduce both the computation and data movement overhead. And uh, we show large performance and energy benefits at low area cost. Uh, yeah, so that's the talk. Uh, I stop sharing. Uh, Mohammed, I guess now. Yeah, we can. Are there any burning with... questions?
Okay, thanks a lot, Nika. Yes. Sure. I think we are done. So for the next talk, uh, we invited Dr. Minesh Patel for a guest lecture. Minesh, are you online? Uh, yes, I am. Um, Great. Hi, Ahmed. Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah, let me adjust those blinds. Okay. Yeah, okay, thank you. Feel free to share your slides and then start your talk. Thanks a lot. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Mohamed. Okay, so I'll uh, go ahead and get started. So um, yeah, hi everyone, I'm Manesh and yeah, I'm honored to be invited uh, for this guest lecture today. So I was a PhD student in owner's group up until last year and I'll soon be starting as a faculty member at Rutgers University at, in, at New Jersey um, in the US. So today I'm gonna to give an overview of some ongoing work that we have to rethink how we build and use DRAM today uh, to tackle DRAM scaling challenges going forward. And so this is essentially a work in progress. So I'd be happy to hear what anyone thinks if they're you know, interested in the work. So I'll start off by um, talking about the goals of this work, right? So three main goals we have here are to reflect on how we as researchers and practitioners build and use main memory today. And second, we want to consider the indirect costs that are inherent in today's memory design practices. And third, we want to improve how we address any future problems that might come up that are difficult or impossible to anticipate. And so um, with that in mind, I'll go ahead and go uh, to the executive summary of my talk. So the problem that we're addressing here is something that I imagine you've heard a lot about through this course, right? So uh, overcoming DRAM scaling challenges requires new and creative solutions from everyone involved in the DRAM design and use process. Um, we observed that the separation of concerns between the people who produce DRAM and the people who consume DRAM, who we call DRAM producers and consumers, is actually a barrier to overcoming these DRAM scaling challenges. And this is for two main reasons. So first, the separation of concerns is too rigid to adapt to any unexpected challenges that might arise. So a good example of that is Rohammer. So before Rohammer was observed, it was very difficult to anticipate that such a thing might occur. And um, we could say that the industry and the consumers weren't necessarily prepared for it. And second, the separation of concerns also discourages any new solutions that are based on cooperation between DRAM producers and consumers, which we call system memory cooperation. So our key idea in this work is to revise the separation in a way that encourages new solutions to be developed. And so to take a look at this, we conduct four different case studies, um, ranging from looking at system performance, energy efficiency, reliability, and security with respect to DRAM. And through these case studies, we identify memory testing to be the primary culprit for discouraging new solutions that consumers might wanna develop. And so our approach to overcome this challenge is a two-step plan to revise DRAM standards, which implement the separation of concerns. And so for the near term, um, we consider crowdsourcing and publication-based approaches to share information between these two groups. And in the longer term, um, we believe changes are necessary to the industry-wide DRAM standards. And so with that, I'll uh, go ahead and jump into the talk. So I'll start out with some uh, overview about DRAM scaling challenges. So DRAM is central to all manner of computing systems because it has served as main memory over five decades and growing and it's still going strong, right? So we have a range of different computing systems that benefit from this technology. And today we see that DRAM makes up over half of the global memory market, um, the bulk of the remainder being NAND flash memory. So across all of these decades, DRAM-based systems have benefited from significant advancements in DRAM design. So this figure here shows a survey of DRAM chips that we conducted um, using publicly available DRAM chip data sheets. And so the data here shows uh, capacity per chip on the y-axis, which is essentially a proxy for DRAM chip density. And um, the 
time along the y-axis essentially. So we see here that uh, essentially DRAM has advanced relatively steadily in chip in uh, storage density across time. And this actually represents over uh, six orders of magnitude in a relatively steady fashion. And so similarly, performance parameters that we can measure um, as various access latency timings um, have roughly reduced over time. And these are shown in color. And so here I'm showing four different key timing parameters that all contribute to memory access performance. And so since DRM was incepted around 1970, um, we've seen over an eight-fold improvement in these access latencies. And so all of this represents significant advancement in the DRAM industry. So unfortunately, we observed that in the past couple of decades, these improvements have slowed significantly and potentially stagnated altogether. So let's take a closer look at why this is the case. So building DRAM requires very specialized design and manufacturing techniques. And so this means that DRAM scaling has traditionally been driven by DRAM manufacturers um, because they have the specialized technologies necessary to do this. So um, taking tightly packed DRAM cells as the base technology here, um, DRAM manufacturers have essentially used new circuit designs, um, different materials for building the chips and fabrication techniques to build denser and denser DRAM chips. So here I show some examples of um, different DRAM packages and standards, uh, but they all essentially rely on the same base technology to operate, which has been improved over time. Now, unfortunately, uh, DRAM is susceptible to many errors as I'm sure we've seen in past lectures. Uh, and so DRAM essentially suffers from these errors, which can cause data loss or system failure if we ignore them. And um, these errors occur due to a variety of mechanisms that affect the actual bit level storage array. And all of this means that um, these errors are related to scaling and scaling essentially becomes more difficult at higher storage densities because these smaller, denser cells are less reliable. And as a result, it's very costly to continue building um, high density chips because of the overheads of maintaining reliable operation. So let's take a look at some of the ways that DRAM manufacturers might mitigate these errors as they scale down chips. So here I'm showing a sort of timeline, not necessarily a timeline, a scale of errors, um, and in particular error rates from low to high. So at low error rates, typically no error mitigation is needed. And this is what we saw of very, very old DRAM chips. Um, as error rates continue to grow, uh, DRAM manufacturers begin to incorporate redundancy-based mechanisms. So an example here is row and column redundancy, where any rows or columns that are observed to be susceptible to errors are essentially replaced at manufacturing time um, by spare rows that are uh, put into the DRAM chip exactly for this purpose. Um, at even higher error rates, uh, manufacturers begin incorporating things like error correcting codes, um, which essentially expands the, the representation of data that we store to the DRAM chip to include metadata that can be used to recover the original data that was stored. And so this expanded representation is essentially tolerant to some of these errors. And as error rates grow even further, um, we start seeing the use of active error mitigation mechanisms, uh, such as target row refresh and refresh management solutions that specifically seek out cases where errors might occur and, and try to prevent them. And um, for future chips with even higher error rates, we will need even more expensive mechanisms to tolerate these errors. And the question is really, how far are we willing to go? And is it really worth it to take this to a certain extent? And so more generally speaking, there's four major challenges that systems have to deal with with continued DRAM scaling. And so each of these are performance, efficiency, reliability, and security. And um, these essentially all arise from different effects of errors affecting the actual bit level storage array. So for performance, um, we want to reduce the long DRAM access latency that we see, but this is difficult to do because that also exacerbates errors. Uh, similarly with DRAM refresh, um, we need to refresh more and more cells, um, which requires us to find ways to improve refresh power and performance. Um, with respect to reliability, we have an overall increasing error rate that we need to mitigate, lest these errors become uh, problems for the rest of the system. And for security, we need to address the worsening row hammer vulnerability as these cells scale down. So going back to this figure, just to summarize this argument, um, much of the scaling that we've seen in the past has been driven by DRAM manufacturers using different circuit level techniques and manufacturing processes. Um, but throughout the past couple of decades, we're seeing slow progress in making these improvements. 
And we conclude that we can't rely entirely on DRM manufacturers alone to overcome these DRM scaling challenges. So next, let's talk about what happens um, or what consumers can really do to improve uh, the DRM scaling process. So first I'll take a step back and look at the producer consumer relationship for DRAM, um, which essentially describes how DRAM is designed and used today. So the first part of this process is that DRAM producers work on designing and manufacturing um, the best possible DRAM chips they can. And this includes the three major manufacturers of DRAM today, who are Samsung, SK Hynix, and Micron Technologies. And so these groups produce a DRAM chip that DRAM consumers can then integrate into their own systems. And so DRAM consumers essentially uh, encompasses anyone who um, uses or studies or tests DRAM chips throughout the course of their work. And that can be people like board designers, test engineers, research scientists, and so forth. I'm um, essentially just about anyone who might be interested in buying and using a DRAM chip. So the key to this relationship is a separation of concerns between the producers and the consumers. And this separation provides three key advantages for both groups. So first, it specializes the roles of each of these groups so that the producers can focus on designing the best possible DRM chips and consumers can figure out how to best use it for various target applications. Um, second, the separation of concerns enables interoperability uh, between um, different DRAM chips by, made by different producers of different types. And third, uh, this relationship preserves the trade secrets that each group would prefer not to reveal to each other and to their own competitors. So the downside of the separation is that it leaves us with a relatively limited solution space to address DRM scaling challenges. And this is essentially because um, the separation of concerns itself is a barrier to addressing these challenges, given that these groups cannot exchange information and are sort of fixed in their design roles. And so two major problems that are inherent to the existing separation of concerns um, is that first, the separation is inflexible when faced with new challenges that arise. So two examples of this are first, row hammer, and second, um, the overall worsening memory error rates. And the second, is that the separation of concerns itself constrains the solution space available to producers and consumers to address those challenges. So I will explain each of these in further detail. So the first problem here is the inflexibility to new challenges that arise. And so to talk more about this, I'll introduce the concept of DRM standards. Um, and so the separation of concerns that I described in the previous slides is implemented by essentially industry-wide standards, which are documents that describe how DRM should be designed and used. And so here are some examples of different DRM standards that have um, been across, essentially come across time. So uh, the JDEC consortium is responsible for a large majority of today's standards, um, but there used to be other standards by a company such as Rambus and um, emerging memories will also have their own standards as they are developed. And so these DRM standards essentially implement the separation of concerns between producers and consumers. And so to discuss how these standards have evolved over time, um, these standards have essentially governed all consumer visible properties of DRAM chips, at least in the ideal case. And so this encompasses things like the interface that the DRAM chip presents to consumers, um, how consumers might configure the DRAM chips designed by the producers, and any performance characteristics that the consumer can expect from the DRAM chips. And um, the goal of these standards are essentially to abstract any sort of design details of the DRAM microarchitecture away from consumers so they don't have to deal with those problems. They can essentially take a DRAM chip that's on the market and integrate it into their systems. So just as an interesting uh, data uh, piece of data here, um, this graph shows um, data from our data sheet analysis um, where we actually look at the length of different DRM standards documents in page count along the y-axis um, across the release date of these specifications. And we see that, you know, ranging from older generation DRM chips, such as the original DDR, DDR2 memories, um, ranging to memories that we're looking at today, such as LPDDR5 and DDR5, um, these documents have become much, much longer. And so this is correlated with the complexity of the designs themselves and the different features they expose and the performance characteristics that they describe. And so, you know, we can expect this trend to continue potentially. That's just an interesting piece of data to look at standards in the scope of the evolution. So, to come back to this talk, uh, this concept of the inflexibility of standards, um, what we have observed is that despite all of this uh, extension of the DRM documents, um, the DRM standard documents, excuse me, um, the DRM standards themselves are relatively slow to adapt to changes that occur. And this is 
Primarily, we believe because any changes to DRM standards require industry-wide consensus amongst all DRM stakeholders, including the producers and the consumers. So here to illustrate this, um, I'm going to show a timeline ranging from around 2014 to the modern day. And so one example of this inflexibility is the Rohimer security vulnerability, where it was discovered uh, around 2015, uh, excuse me, 2014, um, somewhere around that time range. Um, but it's taken many, many years for industry to adopt measures to actually start addressing the problem. So in 2017, we started seeing the first DRM chips put out by producers that were marketed as Rohammer free. Um, in in the, the recent past couple of years, we've seen more activity from uh, the industry essentially to start addressing this problem, including some specifications that have been released and uh, discussions in newer standards. Um, but even today, we don't have fully secure solutions to Rohammer despite ongoing research for this entire time period. Uh, the second example here is on-die error correcting codes, which are built into the DRM chips themselves. So the first proposals we saw for these types of circuits were again, around the 2014 timeframe. And it wasn't until much later that these mechanisms started being used. And uh, along with that usage, um, we saw additional problems begin to arise with, you know, how can we then design secondary layers of error correction to match what's going on in the DRM chip? And this problem hasn't really been addressed until the past couple of years. And it's still potentially an ongoing problem for the future. And so essentially for both of these challenges, we have no complete solutions, uh, despite almost a decade having been elapsed since uh, these uh, mechanisms were first introduced, right? Um, so the second problem here, um, where separation of concerns actually begin to constrain the solution space um, is what I'll discuss next. So I'll introduce this concept of system memory cooperation. Um, which is essentially a promising set of solutions for addressing DRAM scaling challenges um, by having DRAM producers and DRAM consumers uh, essentially work together to address these scaling challenges jointly. And so these solutions are typically driven by consumers using information from the producers themselves. And this results in highly efficient solutions uh, based on a more holistic understanding of how uh, DRAM technology scaling actually impacts the system. And so there's many examples of these kinds of solutions. Um, so for example here, to improve system level performance, energy, and power, um, DRAM consumers can exploit slack in the operating parameters for DRAM. So for example, access and refresh timings, um, the operating voltage and temperature. So there have been many research works in the past uh, looking at how exploiting the slack in these sorts of parameters um, enables us to uh, deal with the DRAM scaling challenges that prevent us from improving DRAM access latency, uh, DRAM refresh overheads, and, and so forth. Um, to improve uh, reliability, consumers can roll their own mechanisms to protect against and test for any failures that might impact the rest of the system. And so this includes designing system level error mitigations and having detailed qualification, uh, test, and validation methodologies at the system level. And to improve security, consumers can implement secure Rohammer uh, defenses at the system level um, and potentially even extend this to other types of attacks such as cold boot attacks and as we've seen a bit of talk about the row press sort of problem. Um, so the problem here is that the separation of concerns actively discourages using these sorts of cooperative solutions. And this is because the separation of concerns prevents producers and consumers from directly exchanging information outside of DRAM standards. And so this effectively um, prevents consumers from gaining insights into the DRAM design and producers from gaining insights into how consumers are using those DRAM chips, therefore making these sorts of cooperative solutions very difficult to adopt. So another way to potentially look at this is to conceptualize the space of all possible DRAM operating points. Um, the blue box here shows a subset of possible operating points that are, are encompassed by the DRAM standards. And the green box here shows uh, the cooperative solutions that I previously discussed. And so essentially this cooperative solution space exists outside the space of the standardized operating points. And so in this diagram here, the standardized operating points are encouraged designs um, because they essentially result in low total cost of ownership. So for producers, this means that standardized designs are fully specified by standards and they can be proprietary because the only information they need to expose is that which is specified by the standards. Um, for consumers, the DRAM chips that conform to this operating point are essentially fully supported by the producers and they exhibit predictable behavior. Now, any solution that's outside of the standardized operating points is essentially discouraged. And this is because it exhibits a high total cost of ownership. 
And that's because for producers, such a design is out of specifications and essentially unsupported. And for consumers, um, these sorts of operating points can result in unknown behavior and they aren't encompassed by any warranties that you know, producers might give for standardized operating points. And therefore, this means that the cooperative solutions that we're looking to adopt are actually also discouraged, right? Because they exist outside of the standardized regime. So to overcome this problem, our idea is to encourage cooperative solutions. And so in the near term, um, we would like to enable these cooperative solutions, um, at least to some extent, by growing the space of cooperative solutions so that there's some overlap between the two. And for the longer term, um, we would like to expand the DRM standards themselves to encompass the cooperative solutions that we would like to see. And so in both of these approaches, we'd essentially like to encourage the overlap between the standardized operating space and the cooperative operating space um, so that all of these cooperative solutions become low total cost of ownership designs. So now I'll talk about how we can enable system memory cooperation going forward. And to study this, um, we do a survey of system memory cooperative solutions um, to try and understand what's actually holding them back from achieving widespread adoption. And so here I'm showing again, these four key DRAM scaling challenges that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. And so here I'll focus a bit on the efficiency angle. Um, and you know the paper contains the information that we have about the rest of these different case studies. Um, so I'll talk about efficiency just to sort of give an example of what I'm talking about. So here we do a case study of mitigating DRM refresh overheads. So I'm gonna gloss through some of these introductory slides because you know, you've seen a lot about this in previous lectures. Um, so just to you know, give a high level description, a DRM cell consists of a storage capacitor and access transistor, which stores a single bit of data um, using the charge in the capacitor. And so the, uh, the charged um, state can represent either a one or zero, which depends on the DRM design. And the discharge state represents the opposite. And so unfortunately, this charge leaks over time. And so this can result in data retention errors. And we use DRM refresh to prevent these errors from occurring, which periodically restores the charge in all DRM cells. Now, unfortunately, um, DRM refresh results in significant system performance and energy overhead. So here's some data taken from a previous, uh, a previous paper. So on the y-axis here, we have average system performance overhead, um, which is normalized to a baseline system using no DRM refresh. And we see that for different DRAM chip sizes, um, the refresh overhead is actually significant. And so here, the performance overhead ranges all the way up to in excess of 15% for um, 64 gigabit chip sizes. And essentially, this is because there's more cells to refresh. Now, as I think uh, previous lectures have talked about, um, most DRAM cells actually do not fail at an extended refresh interval. So here's some example data showing that, which we took from a representative DRAM chip at a, a specific temperature of 45 degrees centigrade. And we see that as we extend the refresh interval uh, to multiples of the default refresh period, there are actually only a few failures, right? So in with modest increases, eight to 16 X of the baseline refresh interval, um, excuse me, the refresh period. And we see that there's relatively few failures, right? So we can potentially um, mitigate DRM refresh overheads by identifying these few cells and um, just refreshing those more frequently. Um, so the problem that we face then is actually finding the fast and slow leaking cells. And so here's a cartoon illustrating what this might look like. So the DRM storage array itself comprises some cells that are slow leaking and a few cells that are fast leaking. Now, the problem is that finding those cells that require frequent refreshing, so essentially the fast leaking cells, is a difficult task that relies on the concept of memory testing. Um, so in order to conduct testing to identify these cells, we need to know or reverse engineer some sort of DRM design details. Um, for example, how cells are physically organized within the DRM chip and what sort of testing parameters we should use to make sure that we reliably identify these cells. And the real problem here is that all of this memory testing is unsupported by the separation concerns. So to describe this process a different way, um, let's say the problem of finding weak cells is that given a DRAM chip, we want to identify the weak cell locations. So there are a couple of ways we might go about this. Um, so in either case, we start with the chip design properties. So we know something about the DRAM chip microarchitecture. And based on that, we can either develop a testing methodology which um, uses sort of worst case access patterns, um, features on the chip that uh, we know to try and mitigate these errors and configures the DRAM chip so that we can study the errors directly, uh, which gives us some test results, right? So error probabilities for different cells, um, error, statistical error distributions across the chip, um, lists of failing cells and things like that. And from that information, we can then infer the locations of weak cells. Uh, but the other path we can take is through modeling. Um, which, result, which um, relies on things like analytical models, um, statistical distributions, um, things like that, 
that essentially model uh, these DRAM chips uh, reliability behavior based on the chip design properties that we start with. And the problem with all of this is that everything that I just discussed essentially violates the separation of concerns. And that's because none of these details are um, provided to DRAM consumers by the DRAM standards that we have today. And so going back to this diagram I showed earlier, uh, the problem is that essentially all of the different things that system designers can do to cooperatively address DRAM scaling challenges rely on unstandardized information about DRAM reliability and testing. And so what this means is that these four uh, case studies all together, um, all of the different DRAM, uh, syst uh, excuse me, the system memory cooperative solutions that we look at are essentially discouraged because um, the information that they need to actually adopt these mechanisms are abstracted away by DRAM standards. Okay, so now I'll move to the last part of this talk, which is revising the separation of concerns. So the question here is how should we revise the separation of concerns to try and overcome this problem? Um, we believe that our near-term recommendations to the industry should satisfy three properties. So first, they should be achievable, um, which means that they don't rely on specific changes to DRM hardware, because that would require waiting on generations of DRM technology to sort of apply those changes. Um, these changes should also, uh, excuse me, these recommendations should also be practical. Um, which means they should preserve uh, the ability to um, have the separation between producers and consumers, which means preserving, for example, the trade secrets that uh, enables the DRM producers to be competitive in the market. And the third property is that we want these uh, recommendations to be backwards compatible and essentially enable uh, today's consumers to continue using the DRM chips that they already have and um, essentially have this commodity DRM chips still work as they do today. Now, our longer term recommendations, we believe can be more encompassing because um, there's time for those sorts of changes to take effect. So uh, to basically revise the separation concerns, we then split this into a near term and a long term uh, solution, where in the near term, we focus on enabling information transparency between producers and consumers. And in the longer term, we focus on changes to DRM standards. And so we hope that through this process, any new designs that are enabled through our near term approach uh, sort of are naturally adapted or integrated into future standards. So for the near term, um, we essentially study the practicality of different forms of information transparency. So here's a sort of, uh, again, a, a scale, let's say, of different levels of information transparency, um, ranging from what we have today, which is essentially a black box about um, how the DRM chip actually functions internally. Um, to a fully white box solution, which you could think of as a potentially open source DRAM, right, where all of the design details are available to DRAM consumers, and a gray box solution that's somewhere in between. So looking at three different categories of evaluating the sort of uh, upsides and downsides of these different forms of information transparency. Um, so first we see that the producer burden for today's DRAM is low because the producers can simply uh, produce what DRAM standards require and call it a day essentially. Um, with a more white box solution, however, the producers have to support a wider variety of designs, um, which means that they have a much higher burden than they do for today's DRM chips, um, potentially impractically so. Um, on the other hand, the consumer burden uh, doesn't increase quite as much because consumers are potentially still able to use DRM chips as a drop-in solution. They just have a lot more options to work with. And so there we say that gray box and white box solutions are essentially still low to medium overhead designs. And in third category here, system memory cooperation, um, today's black box solutions fully discourage uh, cooperative solutions, whereas a white box solution fully encourages them. And so based on this sort of dichotomy between uh, the extremes, um, we observe that sort of the gray box approach gives us a good middle ground. And so we believe that's a good place to start for our near term solution. And so this requires some amount of information released from uh, DRM producers to consumers. And so the next step then is to identify what information to release. And so uh, based on our case studies, we know that we want to provide in some sort of information transparency regarding to DRAM design and test information that consumers can then use to do their own studies. And so we want information that sort of requires no physical changes to the hardware, um, but still provides key DRAM chip design properties, for example, microarchitectural details that are useful um, and in some cases fully necessary uh, for consumers to roll their own sort of uh, system memory cooperative solutions. And so we basically choose properties that can be directly reverse engineered by DRM consumers because these are no longer trade secrets that DRM producers need to secretly guard, or right? uh, essentially guard closely uh, because they're already available to consumers who really want to know them. 
And so our paper goes over some examples of this kind of information. And it's things that you might have seen in some previous talks, right? So on the encoding convention for DRAM cells, uh, for, for example, their true and anti-cell layout, which describes um, which cells encode a charge state as data one or data zero and the opposite. Um, many works across the past decade or so have shown that this can be easily reverse engineered by someone with access to appropriate testing infrastructure. And uh, the list goes on with the different aspects of DRAM design, which are useful to consumers to develop their own testing methodologies and models in order to discover the information that they need to discover. And uh, the paper in general talks a lot more about this. I'm not gonna go into detail with this here. Um, so going back to this diagram I showed earlier with our two-step plan to revise DRAM standards, um, we essentially have different approaches for the near and the long term. So for the near term, we want to enable cooperative solutions. And so we do this by enabling limited information transparency about DRAM chip design um, based on the properties that I just discussed in the previous slide. So as for how to communicate this information, um, we believe this can be done practically through two different ways. So first, it can be directly provided by chip manufacturers, so essentially DRAM producers, um, for example, through their chip data sheets, um, revisions to previous data sheets for chips that are already in the field, um, publications through their online websites, um, things like this. And the second approach is a crowdsourced database uh, built and driven by DRM consumers, because for example, the researchers who conducted the studies uh, on DRM chips already have access to a lot of this information and putting it all together um, across all sorts of practitioners, researchers um, in the consumer space, um, we can have a lot of this information out there. And this can potentially even make it easier for DRM producers because then they can simply validate this information um, as opposed to having to release it themselves. Um, for the longer run, we call for revising DRM standards to be more implicitly cooperative. So the exact changes that we seek to make are relatively open-ended and they depend on where the industry goes in the short term. Um, we believe that reasonable changes to broaden these DRM standards uh, essentially don't require excuse me, modifications to DRM chips, um, but rather incorporate information about DRM reliability and testing into the standards in a way that it doesn't exist today. Um, so the specific information we sort of discuss in the paper, it could encompass a lot of different properties that we've studied in the short-term plan, uh, but we believe, we believe what exactly will happen will sort of grow organically based on um, any system memory cooperative solutions that are developed in the short term um, based on information that consumers have available, uh, potentially research proposals that have been made throughout the past decade. Um, and essentially, this will all come about because uh, as we go forward and DRM continues to scale, these problems will become worse and worse, and industry essentially has a need for more efficient scaling solutions. So um, here's a screenshot of our initial thoughts that summarize all the arguments that I've made throughout this work. And um, we encourage you to take a look at this and let us know what you think about it, if you have any thoughts or any suggestions or anything like that. Um, so with that, I conclude my segment of the talk. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Minish. Uh, I think we have Absolutely. quite a lot of time to take some questions. Great, yeah, I'm happy to take some questions if uh, you guys have them. I'm not sure I'll hear them though. I yeah, I think if them. they use the mic, so you can hear you. They you can hear them. So, so you can okay. hear me. Yes, I can. Okay. Perfect. Um, I wanted to ask if you already had some feedback from the chip manufacturers about uh, if they are open to this disclosing uh, information um, about uh, yeah um, chip internals to allow our cooperation. Absolutely, that's an excellent question. Um, I think we've had some preliminary discussions, uh, both with the chip manufacturers themselves and with uh, some of the consumers who are most closely interacting with the chip manufacturers. And so we see two sorts of different arguments from these groups, right? So for the chip manufacturers, um, the, we haven't gotten too much sort of discussion going yet, uh, but I think the gist of what we've gotten from them is that they're willing to do things that consumers are essentially very, very interested in, right? So one way this can happen is through partnerships between specific consumers and specific producers, right? So they could have, you know, non-disclosure agreements or some sort of other industry partnership to develop these kinds of solutions. Um, so for example, uh, some of the DRM standards actually like HBM and uh, the, the high bandwidth memory, um, they've, and uh, the graphics uh, GDDR, they've sort of grown naturally out of collaborations between producers and consumers. Um, but these have been specific partnerships that are sort of hush-hush, right? So the, the wide consumer base doesn't have access to this kind of information until it's publicly released. Um, the 
the producers themselves are driven more by this sort of argument, right? Uh, they're, they're willing to do what the consumers are very, very interested in um, and have the means to do so. Um, the consumers that we've spoken with are very interested in this sort of work because um, for them, it enables a much broader solution space that they don't have to fully rely on anyone but themselves to achieve, right? So imagine a consumer who is concerned about Rohammer um, compromising their system. So they can then develop solutions that they know are secure, um, whether they're truly secure or they're simply obfuscated from everyone else. Um, it doesn't matter. The consumer can roll the solutions that they believe are secure without having to take someone else's word for it, right? They don't have to trust producers to say that these solutions that they have on trip are, so, are secure. Or, um, and they don't have to disclose any of this information to other consumers because they essentially do whatever they want with the information that's exposed. Um, but even for them, it's very hard to get any of these design details, right? So. Uh, even, you know, as I described, considering these uh, relationships between producers and consumers that go on behind the hood, um, the, the consumers typically don't have access to the kind of information that I described in the slides earlier. And, you know, the paper talks a bit about that. So these consumers are sort of champions of this sort of work, right? And so we've been having a lot of discussions with them and they're very supportive of it. So I think that's the state of our discussions at this point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, we are done with uh, Minish talk. Thanks a lot, Minish, for sure. joining our lecture. Thank you, Mohammed. It's a pleasure to be here. I'll stop sharing. So I think now we have also time for 10 minutes uh, presentation. Uh, we will have a five minutes break and then uh, Nisa will present uh, her work for 10 minutes until four and then we are done.
Okay, I guess this is also on. Can you quickly check? Yeah, okay. Yes, can you hear me? No? Okay, say something. <laughs> Hello. Can Zoom here? Okay. Let me do this. Starting, okay. <laughs> nice. Uh, Hello, I'm Nisa and I'll be presenting our work, Dr. Strange, and Tan System Design for DRAM based two random number generators. Some of the slides will be a bit familiar to you because Ataberk already presented some work on uh, DRAM based two random number generators. So you're already familiar with the motivation. I'll first begin with a brief overview. Uh, random numbers are important for many applications, including secure tech applications and uh, DRAM based two random number generators can provide two random numbers at low cost on a wide range of computing systems. However, no prior work on DRAM based DRNGs provides an end to end system designed to enable these mechanisms in real systems. We identified three key challenges to enable these uh, mechanisms in uh, systems that we use today. As DRAM is used as main memory, uh, random number generation in DRAM can create interference between regular memory requests and ING requests. And this can slow down both types of applications that use random numbers and that don't need random numbers that are running concurrently in a system and uh, basically degrade the system performance. This RNG interference can cause unfair prioritization of RNG applications uh, that are intensively using random numbers uh, that are not, sorry, <laughs> okay, so this, uh, sorry, okay, uh, this interference causes uh, prioritization of applications that intensively use random numbers. Uh, and this basically creates this uh, unfairness in the system. And third, uh, random number generation in DRAM has a high latency and applications that use uh, random numbers intensively uh, can, have, can experience uh, significant slowdowns. So our goal in this work is to design an end-to-end -end system uh, for DRAM-based energies with low cost and high performance. To this end, we propose Dr. Strange, uh, which is an end-to-end -end system designed for DRAM-based uh, TRNGs that uh, reduces the interference between regular memory requests and RNG requests by separating them in the memory controller, improves system fairness by, uh, with an RNG uh, memory request scheduler, and hides large TRNG latency with uh, using a random number buffer mechanism that uses a new DRAM items predictor. Based on our evaluations, we show that Dr. Strange improves the system performance by, uh, for non-RNG applications by 17.9% and for RNG applications by 25%. It also improves average system fairness by 32% when generating random numbers at a 5 gigabits per second throughput. And it reduces the average energy consumption by 21%. Okay, so let me motivate our work first. True random numbers are critical for many applications, uh, including security applications, randomized algorithms, and scientific simulations. And they can be only generated by sampling random physical processes. Uh, systems usually use dedicated hardware to random number generators uh, to provide random numbers to these applications. However, we cannot use them, use these uh, dedicated hardware uh, tier ranges in all systems, uh, for example, embedded systems and processing in memory architectures. In contrast, DRAM is widely available and can be integrated into mobile and IoT devices as main memory. And uh, these mechanisms can enable low cost and high throughput to random number generation within widely available DRAM chips. However, none of the prior work proposes an end-to-end -end -end system design that uh, uses these DRAM-based changes in real systems. Uh, we identify three key challenges for integrating DRAM-based changes into a, an, a baseline RNG oblivious real system. The first challenge is the energy interference. Uh, true random number generation is time consuming uh, when it's done in DRAM and it can be very intrusive in a system that uses DRAM as main memory. It can stall uh, memory requests and the interference between RNG and regular memory requests can significantly slow down both types of applications. 
And the second challenge is the unfair prioritization of RNG applications that use intensive, that intensively uses random numbers. Uh, because uh, the memory request schedulers are optimized to achieve high throughput. And these types of applications can create a lot of memory requests based on the uh, random number throughput that they require. So because of that, the uh, schedulers can prioritize them further uh, compared to non-energy applications requests. And this can create a, 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 an unfairness in the system. And the third challenge is the high TNG latency. So uh, since the random number generation is time consuming, uh, some applications could ask for random numbers and they can wait for a lot of time. Uh, and in the meantime, they cannot progress because they depend on that random number. And if they use a lot of random numbers, this means that their performance is degraded by a lot. So our goal in this work to develop a low cost and high performance end-to-end system designed for DRAM-based TNGs that minimizes the slowdown of both types of applications and improves system fairness while mitigating the performance degradation on ING applications. So our solution consists of three main components. Uh, the first one is random number buffering mechanism, which we will be talking about in detail. And uh, other components are ING aware scheduler and the application interface. The first component is the random number buffering mechanism. It predicts and utilizes DRAM idle times uh, like the channels that are idle at times and to generate random numbers and stores the generated random numbers uh, in a secure random number buffer so that you could use those already generated random numbers when uh, an application asks for a, a random number. Um, the key idea of our DRAM idleness predictor is to use the last access memory address used to predict the length of the idle periods. It does so by using that address, the last access memory address, to access the predictor table, which consists of two bit saturating counters. What it does is it basically predicts the length of the idle period as short or long uh, compared to the time it takes to generate random numbers. Because what we want to do basically is uh, to, we want to avoid the short idle periods because potentially it could lead to more RNG interference. And uh, by accurately predicting idle uh, period lengths, we can uh, choose long idle times to generate random numbers and reduce the RNG interference. So by combining these two components, uh, the random number buffering mechanism uh, generates random numbers with low cost, with low RNG interference, and it can serve the request with low latency. And second component is the RNG aware scheduler. Uh, it accumulates ING and regular memory requests in separate scheduler queues to reduce the contention for queue space. Because as you can see, if you had one read queue, all, uh, all your random number requests and also memory read requests could be queued to one queue. And then you could be, you could be seeing some uh, scenarios where you block uh, regular memory requests from these queues. And when you have more uh, queue space by adding this ING queue, you don't block regular memory requests of applications that do not require random numbers. Um, how does it do? Like the prioritization of uh, things uh, is done with the priority levels set by the operating system. So the, so the operating system already has uh, priority levels that it uses to manage hardware resources. So it already prioritizes some applications over others when it uh, schedules different jobs of different hardware resources. And what we do here is that the ING aware scheduler uses these priority levels set by the operating system and prioritizes some, applica some applications requests uh, that could be random number requests uh, when they are uh, prioritized and they could be served quickly. Uh, by doing so, uh, basically, what we do is we reduce the energy interference by separating them and improve system fairness. Okay. And the last component is the application interface, uh, which sort of uh, completes the whole design. So what we want to do here is to make sure that we are secure. So this application interface is the way to communicate with, the, with these components. It exposes the secure interface to applications that ask for random numbers and limits the access to security critical components such as random number buffer. And this completes the end-to-end -end system design and ensures security. Uh, I will talk about the evaluation and results 
uh, quickly. So we evaluate the performance, fairness, energy efficiency, and area overhead of Dr. Strange. Uh, we, con we conduct cycle level simulations using Remulator and uh, DRAM power, and we use these configurations given in the slide. I'll share the key results. Uh, we conclude that Dr. Strange improves the performance of both non-energy and energy applications compared to the Air Job's baseline design. It improves the average system perform. For, uh, sorry, it improves the average performance of ING applications compared to when it runs alone as a single core, basically by uh, reducing the TNG latency uh, by serving them from the buffer. And lastly, Dr. Strange improves the system fairness by 32%. Uh, we also evaluate Dr. Strange with four, eight, and 16 core workloads and show similar results. Uh, from that uh, experiment, we conclude that the performance improvement of Dr. Strange actually increases with the number of memory intensive applications in the workload mix. So this means that when you have a lot of applications running together and using the main memory, you see more benefits from Dr. Strange. And we evaluate the area overhead and energy consumption of Dr. Strange and conclude that it incurs minor area overhead and reduces the average energy consumption. So we have more uh, analysis in our paper. We discuss the security of Dr. Strange and show that our random numbers are secure. We also discuss timing side channel attacks, cover channel attacks, and denial of service attacks and uh, ways to uh, mitigate those. And we have many more results, uh, including the impact of each component, comparisons with other memory request schedulers, and also a second reinforcement learning based DRAM items predictor. So if you're interested in that, I invite you to read the paper. And this concludes my talk. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Or if you have more questions, I can take them. I was so focused on timing, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes. Can you use the microphone? Yes, yeah, so I have one question. You said you are buffering the random values in the, mm -hmm. in the buffer and then reuse them. Isn't this insecure? So uh, we don't reuse them. That's the, uh, I guess, crucial part. So what happens is when we generate random numbers beforehand, we put them in the uh, buffer. And the application interface uh, is basically a system. So the application uses a system call to reach that, uh, access that buffer. And when uh, a random number is read from the buffer, we discard it. So we don't serve the same random number to different applications. Since we limit the access to the buffer with that system called an application interface, it's not insecure. So the no random number is used twice, basically. Okay, thank you. Problem. Other questions? Yes, no. Okay, I think with that we can conclude today's meeting. Uh, thanks a lot, Nisa. And see you all tomorrow. Thank you.